So another issue that is explicitly mentioned is the conquest of Qisthantiniya. Qisthantiniya. Constantinia is of course Constantinople Named after the Roman Emperor Constantine They were so humble that they wanted to name cities after themselves You know, So it was very common to name cities after themselves And so Constantine basically made the city his capital And he named it after himself Constantinople And Constantinople became the bastion of human civilization For almost a millennia This was the city and the land this was the really there was no competition with any other civilization up until the coming of islam for a millennia a thousand years almost almost constantinople was the cradle of civilization and amazingly our prophet and predicted Constantinople will be ours again we are coming so many centuries later we don't even think about this one of the most significant episodes in human history or I should say recorded human history one of the most significant episodes is 1453 and the conquest of Constantinople this is something that we just take for granted we put it in our you know footnotes most of our kids have no clue but in reality it was the most cataclysmic the most seismic you know uh, disruption that happened in medieval history because it signified essentially the end of the roman empire and the conquest of islam over the byzantine and roman empire and the muslim ummah eventually conquered obviously constantinople of course the beginnings were with muawiyah he wanted to conquer from the time that's what abu ibn al-sari passed away outside Constantinople from the time of the Sahaba they wanted it multiple expeditions took place but it was left to Suleiman uh, sorry Sultan al-Fatih the Muhammad the second Muhammad or they call him the Turks call him Muhammad or Muhammad the second uh, the Sultan al-Fatih uh, in 1453 who finally conquered Constantinople and he converted it to Istanbul so Istanbul is of course what Constantinople of course you still go and you see I mean really subhanallah personal note here i mean that the the uh you know uh, aya sophia the Hagia sophia what an amazing what an amazing testament to human mind i mean this is a building that has been it was built before the birth of our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and we see it now in 2019 and we are in awe can you imagine the people of that time we see it now and it is massive and big and no pillars and no beams and no and the architecture and it has been standing for 1500 something years as it is i mean truly and that's just one aspect of uh you know their civilization in any case what is the purpose of going all there because our prophet and predicted the conquest of constantinople however good enough easy but there's a problem and that is some ahadith mention that constantinople will be conquered Excellent, without any time frame. Excellent. We can take that and say Suleiman, so, Sultan al-Fatih did or sorry, say Sultan, yeah, Fatih Sultan, Muhammad II did it, no problem. But there are other ahadith that mention this conquest will take place towards the end of times, when the Dajjal is around the corner, when the Mahdi is around. And this throws a huge spanner in our understanding. What does that mean? Because Istanbul is Istanbul now. What does that mean? Allahu A'lam. I have no explicit or clear-cut or unambiguous answer. The only thing that can be said is that that land will revert to being controlled by a group that is not sympathetic to Islam. Maybe even if they call themselves Muslims, you know, Allah knows best. Because again, for a time frame, Ataturk, maybe it could be called that is a Darul Kufr government, you know, what Ataturk did, you know. But now it is not like that. Now Istanbul, Alhamdulillah, it is a Alhamdulillah, Muslim land and whatnot. So definitely it's not like that now. But maybe things are going to change in that land. May Allah protect all Muslims. But maybe things are going to change. And there will be a reconquest of Istanbul, of, of, of Qustantiniya. Also, the ahadith mention that that reconquest will take place miraculously without any blood being shed. That was not Sultan Fatih. Sultan Fatih, it was a bloody war. It lasted many months. There was a siege. There was a military. There was a navy. There was an army. There was a blockade. It was a standard war. Many people died. That's not what the hadith predicted. And again, you cannot enact a hadith. Alhamdulillah, Sultan Fatih conquered it, but that's not what the hadith predicted. We'll mention these hadith. Now, of these hadith, now, this is a hadith I'll quote you. It is 
uh, in its narrish in its chain is a weak narrator, so it is a weak hadith. So we're just mentioning with the disclaimer it is a weak hadith. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As said, You will fight Constantinia three times. Does he mean the city of Constantinople? Or does Constantinople indicate the Roman Empire, i.e. Europeans? Either can be there. You will fight Constantinia three times. The first time is that you will do well, but you will not succeed. The second time, you will enter into a sulah with the Constantinia. So much so that masajid will be built inside Constantinople. Now this is really bizarre because masajid did not exist in Constantinople up until 1453. And now there are only masajid in Constantinople. But this is not, doesn't seem to be reference to that. Again, all of these are cryptic. So until there is a sulh between the Romans and there are masajid inside Constantinople, then you will return for a third time and you will conquer it with the takbir. You will say Allahu Akbar and it will be conquered. And the Prophet ﷺ said that one third of Constantinia will be destroyed and one third will burn down and one third will be divided amongst you. Now, this hadith seems to indicate a final conquest of Constantinia and this is something that once again it is mentioned in another hadith which the majority of scholars had in, have interpreted to mean Constantinia. And I'll mention it now. Now the hadith I just quoted you, it is weak. It is mentioned in the Kitab al-Fitan of Nu'ib ibn Hamad and it is weak. The one I'm about to quote you now, it is authentic Sahih Muslim. These two hadith seem to add to some concept. What is it? The hadith is as follows. The Prophet asked the Sahaba, it's a famous hadith Sahih Muslim. Have you heard of a city, half of which is in the water and half of it in the land? Or in another narration, have you heard of the city, part of it is in the water and part of it is in the land? The vast majority of our commentators said this is Constantinia. Because Constantinople, essentially it divides Asia from Europe. You, know, you have the Bosphorus Straits, right? And you have that city that, you know, it's considered that it is basically one half this way, one half that way. So the majority of our ulama and no way have been Kathir, others, they say this is Constantinople that the process is describing. They said, yes, we have. Listen to this now. The Prophet said, Hadith is a Sahih Muslim. The Qiyamah will not happen until 70,000 of the Bani Ishaq will conquer it. Not the Bani Ismail. The Bani Ishaq will conquer it. And when they come to it, they, the Bani Ishaq, will not fight with swords, nor will they fight with arrows. Rather, they will say, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, and one of the sides will fall down. Then they will say, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, and another side will fall down. Then they will say, La ilaha illallah, two, three, four times, until all four sides will be fallen down. And then they will enter the city and begin to distribute his ghanima. And while they are distributing his ghanima, the shaitan will call, or a crier will call, that verily the Dajjal has come out to your family, and they will leave everything and return to their family and hadith. Now, we've heard a similar hadith before, but now we have an added detail. What is that detail? 70,000 of the Bani Ishaq will conquer Constantinople. So, putting all of this together, it is plausible, very reasonable to say that the armies of the Mahdi, the armies of the Mahdi will be fighting at multiple places in this world. And some of the fighting will be more severe than others. And one of the very end of those battles will be the battle of the conquest of Constantinople. But in this battle, there will be no war. There will be no blood. There will be no swords. It will be a miracle given to them. The people in that battle will come and find the walled gates and they will realize they cannot fight the people of the city, but they will know this hadith. And the Prophet system is telling them, you're going to use this tactic of mine. He's telling them what to do. And they believe in the hadith, so they will use this tactic. So they will say, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. Four times, all of them in unison, their takbirat and their tahlilat, they are going to cause the walls to fall down and they will conquer the city without any bloodshed. And then the news will come, the jal has come. So they will flee back to 
Bilad al-Sham from Constantinople only to discover it was a lie. Then when they're in Sham, Dajjal will actually come. And then they're w well, wondering what to do or fighting him a few times and then Isa will come. And then as I, we had mentioned before, it resumes. Now, who are the Bani Ishaq? Some ulama have said that this is a reference to the Romans that they were considered to be the Arabs would call them because Bani Ishaq is not it's not the standard term for the Yahud Bani Israel is the standard term and who is Israel by the way Ya'qub not Ishaq because Ishaq had multiple or he had two sons right uh, Is or Isa or Is and Ya'qub Jacob right uh, Esau and Jacob according to the uh, the Old Testament right uh, so Allah knows best some people say that the Arabs thought that some of the Romans were the descendants of Is, of Isa, the second son. So to say Bani Ishaq is essentially a reference to the Romans. This is an interpretation. Another interpretation, it means the converts of the Yehud. And even some scholars said, and I don't agree with this at all, but some scholars, I'm just saying what they said, telling you what they said. Some scholars said, oh, this must be a mistake. The Prophet said Bani Ismail, and one of the narrators messed up, and he made it Bani Ishaq. But that, that's too... I mean, this word is so rare. It's impossible that somebody would have messed it up, right? So a number of ulama said, this is so bizarre, Bani Ishaq. It never occurs in any hadith, Bani Ishaq. It's not even Bani Ismail. You know, Bani, it's Bani Ishaq, right? Or sorry, it's not Bani Yaqub or Bani Israel. I meant Bani Israel. It's Bani Ishaq. And it appears, and Allah knows best, this goes back because the term 70,000 is mentioned. It goes back to the other hadith which is very clear that there are going to be 70,000. Now remember, 70,000 in Arabic does not mean exactly census 70,000. It is a broad figure. You know, we say in English, man, I called you a dozen times. You don't mean a dozen, right? Now, if you say, I called you seven times, you mean seven, right? But you say, I called you a dozen times. Or I called you so a hundred times. Everybody knows you don't mean it literally. In Arabic, seven 70, 700, 70,000. This is the generic. When you say seven, you mean I called you a few or something. When you say 70, it's around that. So 70,000 basically means around 100,000 or 50,000, around that much, right? It's not exact 70,000. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying there will be 70,000 converts, essentially. This looks like we're deriving this from all of these hadith. It means like 100,000 of them have converted. That's not as minor amount. And they are fighting on the side of the Muslims. And it is at their hands, the hands of the converts, that Constantinople will be conquered. Not at the hands of the born Muslims. It will be those who are pure, those that have chosen to fight with the truth. Allah will bless them. That when they say the takbirat, their takbirat will cause the walls of the city to fall down. And they will then conquer Qistantiniya or Constantinople. Tayyib. Now, this is the standard interpretation. I am sympathetic to it. A number of scholars say, this hadith doesn't apply to Constantinople. Have you heard of a city, a part of it is in the ocean and a part of it is on land? That's what the hadith says. Another group of scholars says, this hadith is a reference to Venice. Venice, canals, whatnot. And we say, maybe, Allahu alam. What can we say? Maybe. I can't deny it, can I? Because the hadith doesn't mention Qistantiniyya. However, other hadith mention Qistantiniyya. No hadith mentions Venice. So, Allah knows best. I am sympathetic to this hadith being Constantinople, but we cannot negate that it might possibly be, that it might possibly be uh, other cities as well, and Allah knows best. Now, we've talked about the Malhama, we've talked about the civil war, we've talked about the... Romans on one side and the Muslims on the other. We've talked about uh, uh, the conquest of Constantinople. There's one set of, of a hadith also left, and that is during one of these series of wars, or maybe before all of this begins, because we don't know. Chronology is not mentioned. We do not know. Towards the end of times, the Muslims and the Romans will form an alliance against a third party. Now this is very atypical from the other ahadith because all the other ahadith mention what? That the Romans on one side and the Muslims on the other side. Correct? So, in my humble opinion, and Allah knows best, 
these ahadith apply at the beginning of the Armageddon. Things are going to happen where Muslims and Romans will ally with one another. And then that alliance will be destroyed only to get worse and worse until the Mahdi and the Jal and Isa come. And Allah knows best. And during this time frame, people will convert from the Roman side to the Muslim side. Okay, what are these a hadith of this alliance and treaty? And also, these are authentic hadith. Uh, this hadith is in uh, Abu Dawood that Awf ibn Malik al Ashja'i said, I visited the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during the battle of Tabuk, when he was in the battle of Tabuk. And his tent was made out of leather. His tent was made out of leather. So I sat in front of the tent. The Prophet sallallahu gave me permission. He said, come in, ya Awf. So, and this shows you how eager the Sahaba were, that Awf was sitting outside. And the Prophet saw him from the, from the opening. He saw Awf. He said, come in, Awf. Awf said, ya Rasulullah, all of me come in or only a part of me come in? Means, should I just stick my head in or do you allow my full body to come in? Yani, subhanAllah, the Sahaba were so particular of the permission. Like, what are you allowing me to come in? This is your private space, Ya Rasulullah. When you say come in, are you saying I fully come in or do you want me just put in my head and talk to you? So the Prophet said, no, kulluk, yani, all of you come in, your whole body come in. So Auf came and he said to the Prophet, uh, sorry, the Prophet said to Auf, O oh, Auf, count six things before judgment will happen. He gave him a prediction. Count six things before judgment day. Number one, mauti, my death. Auf said, as soon as I heard that, I was shocked and saddened. SubhanAllah. We take, obviously, yani the process of not being amongst us, we take it for granted. We're born that way. For the Sahaba, they could not imagine a world without the Prophet ﷺ. They could not imagine. It's something their mind could not conceive of. And that's why when the news came at Uhud, what happened? The Sahaba, they reacted the way they did. And that's why when the Prophet ﷺ actually passed away, Medina was in gloom. As Anas said, we had never seen that sadness in our whole lives, right? So they could not imagine a world without So they never thought, you know, yani, may Allah protect all of our loved ones, but we can never imagine living without our loved ones, you know, with our parents. We don't, the world is there with them. Then when they go, that's when the shock comes to us. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying, count six things. Number one, one mauti. I said it was a shock to me. It was what my, your moat before his mind can grasp. Number two, three, four, five, six come out. So he has to pay attention. Number two, he said. Then uh, the Prophet saw him shocked. He said, "Count that as number one." He's emphasizing the first sign of judgment day is the death of the Prophet ﷺ. That's the first sign. His death is the beginning of a shot al sah. Number two, he said. Fathu Bayt al Maqdis, the conquest of Maqdis. Has that happened? Yes, in Abu Bakr's time. SubhanAllah, Abu Bakr's last day of Khilafah was the conquest of Bayt al Maqdis. And the first day of Umar, he received the Khilafah and the news of the conquest on the same day. Fathu Bayt al Maqdis. And when he said this, it was impossible to even think of Bayt al Maqdis being in Muslim lands. Wallahi, it is one of the biggest miracles of the truth of Islam that our Prophet Sassim predicted these things and they took place within a year after his death. A year after his death, Bayt al Maqdis is conquered. And if you really understand history at that time, this was impossible to conceive of. That this small group of Muslims in Medina who have not yet even conquered Mecca, and they're going to go conquer Bilad al-Sham and Bilad al-Rum and Bilad al-Faris. It's inconceivable. And yet within a year that took place. One of the most unexpected historical turns for Western historians is the rise of Islam. It is inexplicable. They cannot explain it. How could a group from their perspective of ragtag Bedouins come and disrupt human civilization, destroy the Sassanid Empire, carve out the Byzantine Empire, create a civilization that was even more glorious than the both of those previous ones combined? They don't understand how that happened. So for us, our Prophet said, number two, it will be the conquest of Jerusalem. Number three, a plague that will come amongst you and destroy your children and your wealth and property and it will purify your good deeds. Our scholars say this is the plague of Amwas in the 18th year of the Hijrah. There was a massive plague in the time of Umar al-Khattab. It was the worst plague of early Islam and they say this is that prediction. Number four, wealth will be distributed amongst you so much 
that if a person is given 100 dinars, he would not be happy. The Sahaba were very poor. One dinar was a big deal. A hundred dinars was a fortune to them. And we are now at a time when a hundred dinars is, yeah, okay, no big deal. We're, we're at this time now. Number five, there will be a fitna, a trial that will not leave any of your houses except that it will touch it. Our scholars say, in all likelihood, this is the fitna of the Sahaba, that every single household was affected. Sifin, Jamal, Aisha, Talha, Zubair, Muawiyah, Yazid, that fitan, that first war, that civil war that took place, they say this. Others say this might yet be another fitna that will happen. And then number six, and this is what we're interested in. Number six, there will be a treaty between you and the Romans. There will be a treaty between you and the Romans. And then they will betray you and march against you with 80 banners, under each of which will be 12,000 troops. In other words, 100,000 people. This hadith is in Ibn Majah. Another hadith mentions, another hadith mentions that you will form a treaty with the Romans and you will fight an enemy common to both of you. You will form a treaty with the Romans and you will fight an enemy common to the both of you. Then you will be victorious. And as you are returning back, one of the Romans will raise the cross on a mount and say, this has caused us victory. And a Muslim will get angry and destroy that cross, say Allah has caused us victory. And war will break out and the Romans will break their truce. And then this incident of marching against you will take place. So, these are only two or three hadith about this. That's it. But they predict another genre of predictions. And that is, there will be a third enemy. Who is that third enemy? Allahu A'lam. But it's neither the Muslim peoples nor the Europeans. There is another power on the rise. May Allah protect us from all of them as well. But anyway, this Allah knows whether that power will be the actual one. So, there will be a third race, a third group of people. You and the Romans will join hands in fighting them and there will be an alliance between you and you will be victorious once that enemy has gotten rid of been gotten rid of then the romans will essentially break their treaty with you because of this minor skirmish where a muslim said no it's not the cross and he destroys the cross and it's between two people but the romans will take that as an excuse to destroy the treaty and they will then attack you they will march against you with 80 banners now many of our modern scholars say this is must be a reference to the modern united nations or whatever i say allahu alam allahu alam but 80 flags 80 flags on one side every flag has a major 10, 12,000 people. That's a major war. So this is another prediction of a great Armageddon that will take place. And Allah knows best. Now, again, is this the Armageddon or is it one of them? Again, it's all cryptic. Allah knows best. It can also be said, and this is a valid interpretation. I'm not denying it at all. It can also be said that the final battle between the Jal and Isa will be an easy battle, not a difficult one. And that the Muslims will not die and mass in that battle. And that will be a gift to Allah to the believers. The hadith are not explicit. I'm simply saying it can be derived. How can we derive this? Because when the Dajjal sees Isa, what's going to happen? He will scream, a loud scream, and flee away and dissolve, and Isa will kill him. Now, with Dajjal being killed and his followers see Dajjal being killed, they're all scattering helter skelter. They're all be going, and that's when. The creation will say, come and kill the person behind me, right? It could be said, another interpretation of all of these is, the final battle is not the malhama. The malhama is the one before it, which is this one. The Romans and 80 flags on one side and the Muslims on the other. As for the actual final battle, it will be a gift. Why will it be a gift? There will be no resistance from the other side. You understand this point, right? You guys following? I've given you multiple interpretations. Allah knows best. Now, before we conclude, very briefly, what is the Christian understanding of the Armageddon? The word Armageddon is a Greek word that itself comes from a Hebrew, 
cognate and a Hebrew uh, origin word, Har Majido. And Har in, in Hebrew means a hilltop, and Majido is the name of an ancient city, Megiddo now. Uh, it's the name of an ancient city that now falls in the land of Israel, the, the, the territories and, and, and whatnot. And this, this city of Megiddo, it is close to the city of modern city of Haifa, Jaffa, and of Nazareth, the city of, of Haifa and Nazareth. It is north of Jerusalem. And this, even in pre-biblical times, even in ancient times, uh, this was a city that was inhabited by the ancient Canaanites. It's been inhabited by 7,000 years, one of the ancient cities of the world. And the Bible mentions the city of Megiddo multiple times and there are cryptic references in the book of Revelations that there will be this massive war what the book of Reve the book of Revelations by the way is a book in the Bible in which there are predictions for the future Ashat the Sa'a for the for the Christians is in the book of Revelations the beast 666 the book of Revelations okay Antichrist the book of Revelations it's very cryptic and that's why even many Christians don't read it. It's not an easy text to understand. So uh, there are cryptic references in the book of Revelations to the big battle at Har Megiddo, hence Armageddon. Okay? Hence Armageddon. The term Armageddon comes from Har Megiddo, the hilltops of Megiddo, uh, of Megiddo. And there are a number of interpretations of modern day Christians with regards to these, these statements. Many Christians, this is the default amongst the you know, non-Protestants, uh, many of them, they just reject this. These are just tales. They don't believe. You know, again, Muslims, learn your Christianity if you want to be involved in da'wah. Not all Christians are the same, just like not all Muslims are the same. Many Christians don't consider the Bible to be the Word of God anyway. This is the default in America. The majority of Christians do not take the Bible literally. So it's not a big deal for them. If the book of Revelation says something, no big deal. However, some strands of Christians take the Bible literally. And in particular, of course, evangelicals and the Baptist strand, this is well known for this. And so for them, they have a very, very particular belief in the second coming of Jesus and in the resurrection of the dead and in the rapture, it's called, and in the Armageddon. Now, now is not the time to get into the, the series of events they believe in. There are multiple strands within Christianity. Please study them if you're interested. You have the pre-millennialists, you have the post-millennialists, you have the amillennialists. All of these are various strands of Christianity. Baptists in particular are associated with the strand called pre-millennialism, pre-millennialism, which believes that the second coming of Jesus Christ will be in two stages, that Jesus will come and there will be a seven-year period of tribulation. And the beginning of that will be something called a rapture. And what is the rapture? The rapture for this strand of Christianity, not all Baptists, but most Baptists and many Christians believe this, and it is becoming very common now. There's genre of literature and lots of famous books are being written that are science fiction or not science fiction, fantasy and whatnot, Christian literature and uh, cartoons and whatnot that are watched in, in Christian circles of the imminent coming of the rapture. What is the rapture? For, the, for them, they believe when Jesus comes down, Christians will rise up to meet him in heaven. That's the rapture. They will meet him midway. And they believe that for seven years, there will be this, this battle between the forces of good and evil. The Antichrist will come. By the way, seven years is also in Islamic literature. That's there as well. There's going to be forces between the Antichrist and the righteous people. Then Jesus will come down after seven years and defeat the Antichrist. And then there will be permanent peace on this earth. And then there will be judgment after that. And by the way, some Christian sects believe when Jesus comes again for the second time, that is judgment right then and there. There is no heaven and hell. So the seven-day Adventists, for example, that's what they believe. There is no heaven and hell for them. They believe the coming of Jesus is the uh, itself uh, heaven and hell. And the point being, of course, and there was a survey done a number of years ago, the point being, we need to understand evangelical support for modern politics in light of the belief of the rapture and the belief of the coming of Christ and Antichrist, okay? Over 80% of evangelicals over 80 percent that's not a small number evangelicals not all of americans evangelical americans over 80 percent say that the creation of israel in 1948 is in partial fulfillment of the biblical prophecy and it is signaling the coming of jesus christ and that is why I said this before, and again, I have to get political. When Trump makes Jerusalem the capital of that confiscated region, of that occupied region, 
Trump couldn't care less what the capital is, but he wants to appeal to his his base. The making of Jerusalem the capital is all a part of biblical prophecy. It is all a part of what they believe before the coming of Jesus Christ and before the rapture and before, you know, all of this is going to take place. And so you, you need to understand this group of, of Christians that support this particular candidate, they don't care whether he's racist or not. Frankly, from their perspective, even if he is, if he's expediting the coming of Jesus, what's better than that? You see, there are bigger goals to them. And here is the point. Armageddon, from their perspective, who's going to be on the other side? Hello, ya jama'ah. Muslims and Palestinians. Let's be brutally honest here. So why would they have any love for that group of people? Think about it, right? Their heart, qasiyat and qulubuhum. Because they have theology that is clouding their humanity. They have theology that is clouding their humanity. They're not looking at them as breathing, living individuals anymore. They're looking at the second coming of Jesus. They're looking at Jesus coming back. They want to expedite that process. From their perspective, who is the Antichrist? My dear Muslim brothers and sisters, they call our Prophet ﷺ that title, A'udhu Billah, A'udhu Billah. I'm sorry to say this in a masjid of Allah, but we are living in a land where these, these theolog theological beliefs impact politics. We need to educate ourselves. All that I'm talking about isn't just kalam and here saying no it is realities that impacts policies that impacts us so we need to understand our beliefs and they're radically different from christian beliefs they're definitely not xenophobic we believe many of the romans will convert they're going to be the side of the truth but they don't believe that they believe all of us brown-skinned folk and especially muslims all of us will be in the army of the antichrist that's their aqidah so why should they have any sympathy for us? That's why we need to educate ourselves and them about especially this important topic and clarify our beliefs are different. We also believe in the coming of Jesus. But guess what? We will be on the side of Jesus. You will have to make up your mind. Are you on the side of truth? Are you, will you be with that 70,000? Oh, you'll be on the side of falsehood. Our time is up for today. Inshallah ta'ala. Sorry for no Q&A, but inshallah we'll try next time to give you an extended Q&A. I'll see you next Wednesday. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Experience the beauty of Islam and bring happiness into your life with our app One Islam TV. You will have access to a wide variety of interesting documentaries, inspiring lectures, and so much more. Download One Islam TV from the Apple or Google Play Store today.